Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. I don't know where in the world you're joining us today um, at this really fantastic exclusive event with Barnes and Noble with the wonderful Sandy Jones, who is, of course, the author of The Half Sister, The First Mistake, and the book that everyone knows about, The Other Woman, which was a Reese Witherspoon pick. She's back today to talk about her new book, The Guilt Trip, which if you haven't read it already, you are in for an absolute treat. Sandy, it's such a huge pleasure to be talking to you today. How are you? Thank you, Claire. I'm good. I'm really good. How are you? Very well. I've got so many questions. If you could see me now, I'm surrounded by <laughs> sticky notes. My book is covered with sticky notes because as I was reading, I was making notes of things I wanted to ask you about and uh oh okay okay tons. but do you know what I'm going to dive straight in with okay. um the fact that that the guilt trip is um a, a Barnes and Noble August book club pick this is a big deal how how does that feel it is a very big deal um incredible actually um and I've just I've just I've loved the whole month. I've really enjoyed everybody's feedback. Um, and I love just getting their questions and kind of and asking things. And if they're kind of unsure about something or they want clarification, because there are there are pieces and bits and pieces of it that are slightly ambiguous, I would say. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I, I would say. So I think a couple of readers have kind of asked for clarification on a couple of things. And I'm hoping I've, I'm hoping I've, I've answered their questions. <laughs> well, this, because this is not an easy, this isn't a straightforward book. Now, don't get me wrong, it's, it's a real page turner, but it's complicated. You've got lots of different layers, lots of intrigue, lots of, of lies. Was it a complicated book to write? Yeah, I think it was. For me, I'm, I'm, my books, previous books have been um, just maybe a couple of characters. And um, even with this one, when I pitched it to my publishers, it, it was four characters. It was two couples. Um, and I was, I was kind of comfortable with that. Um, but you know what editors are like, Claire? They kind of throw in a bit of a bomb. And they say, what, what about just adding a few more characters? You know, let's just have another couple thrown in there. And originally, I was just like, no, 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 no. I kind of got, got into a bit of a panic about it all. Um, I thought, no, it's just going to complicate my brain. And I was worried about it complicating it things, overcomplicating things for the reader. Um, but no, I, I, I think it actually needed that third couple. I think it needed, it gave me a lot more freedom and flexibility within the plot to kind of expand in areas that I probably wouldn't have been able to do, I think, if it had just been the four of them. I absolutely agree. I think you've ended up with so many different layers of truth and lies. It, it's yeah. really, um, it makes the dynamic so much richer. So we should probably talk a little bit about what the book's about, because there will be people who have joined this event who perhaps haven't got around to reading their copy yet. So um, can, you, can you tell us what the book is about and where it's set? So it's, um, it focuses on three couples, um, Five of the characters are, are very good friends. They've been very good friends for a very long time. They think they know everything there is to know about each other. Um, but they go on a, a, a wedding weekend to Portugal. And as we, as, as we know, uh, you don't really know each other until you kind of go away with somebody or live for, together for a period, of, even a short period of time. You do find out an awful lot about somebody that you never knew before. Um, and, and this is just the story of this kind of explosive wedding weekend, the kind of secrets and lies and betrayals um, and their past as well um, kind of comes back to haunt them with devastating consequences. It certainly does. Um, so we've got six characters, six main characters. There, there are various other relatives. Um, so at some point you had to make a decision about who was going to narrate this story. And it could, I suppose, have been multiple characters, but you chose, you picked Rachel. Can you tell us a bit about who Rachel is and why you wanted her to tell the story? Um, I, I picked Rachel just because I think the, the majority of the drama happens to her. Um, that there was a there was a point, if I remember rightly, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to remember and to go back, isn't it? But 
I do remember there being a point in my mind where I was thinking maybe Ali should be the narrator. Um, but Rachel seemed to be a better fit, I think. Just, just, just to hide a few of the reveals as, the, as they were presented. Um, and, and she is very much a, a sort of a, a next door kind of girl um, who, you know, she's in love with Jack and um, she thinks they've got a very strong marriage. Um, but as I said, there, there are skeletons in the past that kind of like, are always there, always present. Um, but it, it, did, it took this weekend um, to kind of literally come out of, of the closet, as it were. Um, and yeah, I, th I think she's just a, a very normal girl who I hope we can all relate to. Um, and, and it's just one of those things where, you know, it's a, again, it's an ordinary person, an ordinary setup where extraordinary things happen to her. And I just, I just think she had the, she had the kind of the vision of all the characters to be able to present the story in the best way. And she's going through her own personal journey, isn't she? Because one of the themes that I particularly love, so this, this is absolutely a, a thriller, but it's also a study in, in marriage, in relationship, a study in identity and particularly female identity and how that changes over time. Um, are, those, are those sort of, were they conscious thoughts that you had as you were writing? Were they topics you wanted to write about? Or am I reading too much into just a good thriller? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think certainly with Rachel and Paige, I think um, I was quite keen to explore their relationship in terms of, you know, that they've got children who are very quickly reaching the age where they're kind of beginning to go to university to, to flee the nest, as it were. Um, and I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's a very important stage in in a mother's life um and i think it, it kind of it evokes all kinds of emotions and some that you you want to embrace others that you prefer not to um you know it, it's a very strange um feeling to have you know maybe 18 years of your life uh, looking at you know your primary role in life is, is to look after your child and then all of a sudden they're gone and i just want to explore and touch on how that might feel and how the two women might feel that they kind of reached that point in their life. Because I do think, you know, I have spoken to a few women who were kind of saying, yep, yeah, bye, <laughs> go off to uni, that's great. But I, I think for the most part, I think women, mothers find it quite difficult, or just, just a, not difficult, but just maybe a transitional stage in their life um, that they're not necessarily prepared for. So I just wanted to explore that between, between those two women, especially. Mm. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it, are these, um, uh, I don't know how to put this really. I was gonna say, is this, is this sort of born out of personal experience? I don't mean that some of the horrific things that happen in this novel have happened to you, <laughs> but have you have you been on um, you know a big trip with friends? Have you been to a wedding abroad? How much of this have you drawn on personal experience for? Yeah, I, I think um, I just think there are a lot of books um, centering around a wedding right now, aren't there? And and that's I think that's because the occasion itself should be kind of a um, happy one, yet it's it's so often marred by, um, you know, family dynamics and fallouts from the past and kind of old relationships and old friends that, you know, have been superficially rekindled, I think, you know, because you, you kind of all come together for a wedding and it's all just a little bit, well, in my experience, um, it's Quite. just... It all feels a little bit superficial and a little bit awkward and um, and, and, and it all just creates a, just a, a delicious kind of melting pot, as it were, um, of certainly of material for authors, um, especially thriller writers who, who are kind of always seeking out the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, and I just think weddings are just great places to find all those nuances, all those kind of, um, you know, relationships that that just aren't quite right, but we kind of all kind of smile and for the day, just for the day and pretend that everything's fine. And I just, I have been to weddings like that. Um, thankfully mine was pretty uneventful on my own, um, but there, there still were, you know, people that should have been invited that 
you know, my grandmother, bless her soul, you know, they weren't, so she was offended. And, you know, and, it, and that's just kind of the periphery stuff, isn't it, really? But just when you kind of get really involved in it, it's, it's all sorts of stuff. And even in the lead up to weddings, there's, you know, I've heard some horrific stories of sort of stag weekends and Hindus and things like that that have gone so terribly wrong that the wedding just doesn't happen at all. Um, so it's just, it's just a really great wealth of material for us to kind of delve into and and pull out all the bits it certainly is now i i don't want to give too many spoilers because even though this is the barnes and noble august pick and lots of people and i can see from the comments that loads of you have have read it and loved it some of you won't have read it but i don't think it's a huge spoiler to say that right at the start of the book i mean literally on page one we find out that someone has died. That's yes. that's okay, isn't it, to say that's that? Okay. I'm not... <laughs> so we know that right yes. at the beginning, which, you know, kind of sets the scene quite well, but we don't know who for a really, really long time. I mean, I was so kind of, when am I gonna know? When am I gonna know? How difficult was it to maintain that suspense right the way through the book? I think I'm not I'm not a planner um I'm a pantser so um I have to I am literally flying by the seat of them for for, for the majority of, of my writing process um and I just kind of I suppose in my mind I envisage I envisage a thriller um as being a bit of a as, as a bit of a mountain I suppose where you've just kind of got to keep once you start you've just got to keep steadily steadily climbing um and I do try with every at the end of every chapter just to oh, forgive the pun but just to kind of keep, keep it on a, a cliffhanger um as it were um at the end of each chapter and I I don't actually know how that works in my head I don't know um I really don't know how my mind does that Claire I mean you, you probably I don't know I mean do you well I know I mean you, you, we have talked about this before, and so I knew that, that you didn't plan your books, but I, I'm just as horrified by that now as I was the first time you told me, because the idea of sitting down at my desk and not knowing what's happening next is just terrifying. But this is what makes this such a, a page turner, because we as, we re as we're reading this novel, we're feeling that great unknown, we're feeling the suspense that I guess you felt as you were writing it. How long did it take you to write? Um, this was a bit of a quick one. Um, I, I started it in um, the midst of lockdown um, and it took me a, a very long while to get into my groove um, as I think a lot of us struggled creatively, creativity wise. Um, I, I just, um, I did struggle a little and um, it took me a long while to kind of just get into just even knowing what I was going to do. However, um, thankfully my editors did put a, a quite an unpleasant deadline on me. Um, maybe they knew what was kind of going on this end or they've just felt that I needed a little bit of a kind of friendly, gentle push. Um, but they did put a, an unpleasant deadline and I think it was about three and a half, four months once I kind of got my backside into gear and started I think the first draft uh, was it was delivered within about three and a half four months so I needed it Claire I didn't I didn't need because otherwise I just felt I was just I, I just was on a, a very very odd path and I just could not concentrate or focus for too long or you know without looking at the news and looking at the stats and yeah it just so I needed it so but it so it did turn out to be quite a quick one yes and how similar is this finished copy to that first draft that you did? Pretty close, pretty close. Um, I do, I think we've discussed this before as well. I, I, I do like to think that I deliver a really polished first draft that's finished and ready to go straight into the bookshops. Um, and I do, I work really hard at that. Um, I'm not somebody that kind of just delivers something and then expecting a whole round you know of edits I do try or hope that I'm delivering something that's going to take little work it very rarely does take little work it always takes a lot of work but 
fundamentally the story is the same. I think the very first draft, I think, if I remember rightly, I think somebody else died. Oh, mm. that's interesting. I, yes, I don't think the person that died was the person that died in the first draft. So well, I, yes. well, well. Mm. Gosh, okay. So that, you know, that obviously would be a bit of a, a spoiler to talk about, but on the subject of spoilers, we've had several questions about the ending. And I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can talk around the ending without talking about the ending um, because specifically mm. two or three people would like to would like clarification on whose voice it is at the end now I think it's quite quite clear who is speaking okay. so what I was going to say is that the page before the ending there yes. are two women talking yes and it's one of those women yes it's the woman who was talking at the end of that chapter. It is. And it's also the same woman, or it's also the same voice that's at the beginning of the, the book. Okay. Yes. So, I think, so. That, I think that's enough. So those of you who were asking about the ending, take that on board and maybe go back and reread that last page and hopefully that will, um, that will <laughs> help you. It's um, so difficult, isn't it? I, I think... I, I mean, I did do it. I did do a poll quite recently about epilogues because um, you know it, it's quite an acquired taste. I think you know some readers love an epilogue; um, others don't need it, it to be tied up in in quite a, a neat bow. Um, but it was literally fifty fifty um, in terms of of what people liked, and I just I, I I do try to tie up most of the loose ends. I think in in all of my epilogues, I hope. Um, but I, I do also like to leave an element of doubt. I, I, kn I know the outcome um, that's in my mind. Um, but in the guilt trip, as you, as you say, there are several ways it, it could play out um, from, from the last chapter and the epilogue. And, and there, I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong answer. I think, you know, I, I enjoy, end when I read, I enjoy endings that, that leave me... Um, you know, with a, with a question mark, I, I like that. I, especially if it's like a, a book club read and, you know, because I love the conversations it, it sparks and, and the heated sort of debates that it creates. So I, yeah, I hope I've, I give enough, I, I hope I give enough in the epilogue, but without just putting it quite in a neat little bow and, well, and sending it on life. its way. Life doesn't tie itself up neatly, does true, it? Life true. is a, a little bit ambiguous. Can we talk title, which I know you had a little bit of help with. This is, The Guilt Trip <laughs> is the most perfect title. It's so, so brilliant. But you didn't have that originally, did you? I didn't. We didn't have anything between myself, um, my agent, the publishers. Um, we, we were going round and round in circles and... Um, and as you know, a title, certainly a title and a cover, kind of comes before the book, doesn't it? Um, you know, a long time before the book, and they they want to know what the title is going to be, and they need to know what the title is going to be in order to to be able to sell it um, in advance um, as they as they need to. So, um, so we had nothing at all, and and it really was. I think it was like a really mundane Tuesday night dinner, um, family dinner. Um, we were right in the middle of lockdown, um, so my 23-year-old son had moved back in with us, um, and you know we were still all adjusting to that. And but we were getting there. It was kind of a, we were getting into a routine, um, and I, just, I made a very flippant comment about. And they didn't really even know what the book was about. I didn't really know what the book was about, but I did make a very flippant comment over dinner, just to sort of say, you know, we're really struggling with the title. Um, I can't, we're going to know it when we hear it, but we just can't, we just can't find it. And, and, and I just very briefly gave the, the family a, a, a very brief synopsis of, of what the book was about or what I thought it was going to be about. And, and my son um, just literally, just out of nowhere, Claire, I mean, really annoying. I mean, I, I love him for it, but it was just so inspired. Um, but he just said, well, what about the guilt trip? And, and it was like, Oh, why? Why have none of us? 
yes, why have none of us come up with this? So, yeah, I think he's going to have to be on a bit of a percentage for this one. I don't think I'm going to get away with it, am I? It's perfect. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you about the covers because I've been waving around this, but this does not look anything like the American cover. Really? So this is the UK cover. Yeah. Um, and I feel terrible saying yes. this, but I don't like it as much as the American cover. <sighs> I can say that. It's not my book. I can say that. But, but oh dear, no, I... <sighs> You can't I, say it. It's not a, you're not allowed. No, I'm not allowed. No, but I just they're very, very different. They are they're so different, aren't they? Different. Yeah. This one could almost be a lighter women's fiction style read. Yeah. The US one is very, very clearly thriller. It's got it it says Agatha Christie to me as well, a bit, and then there were none. Um it's got so yes. much jeopardy to it. And yes. it's also a thing of beauty. So I think so. I, I do. Yes, I agree. It I is. love that. And I'm I would love to see in the comments, I just put a little vote in for, for UK yes. or US. Um I'd love to see what you what you think. I'll have a little look in a minute. Now we've got some questions. It's all coming in now. US, US, US. <laughs> Um, <laughs> lots of explanation marks there. So we've, we've had some questions in from readers and some of them we've answered. Christina wanted to, to know about who, um, uh, why you chose to write the, the book from one character. We've talked about that earlier. Um, but she also had a question about how your writing process changed during the pandemic. And you, you spoke a little bit about how the creative process was, was harder. Have any of those habits that you formed, that sort of fast writing, stayed now that life is returning a little bit more to normal? I, I think so. I think because um, we've, we've kind of retrained ourselves, or all of us really, in, in what we do for a living. And I think, um, yeah, I think it has it has changed and it, it will continue to, I, I always, I was always a, a fast writer. I think um, my background in journalism probably um, has helped me um, kind of sort of, I'm always aware of deadlines, even when there aren't any, you know, I'm, it's, it's always there in the back of my mind. Um, but I do think it, it's changed um, the way I'm going to write going forward. And Although, I mean, the home life still, you know, I, I still have my daughter at home. Um, she's been at home now for 18 months, um, unfortunately, off of university. She goes back this weekend. Um, so, you know, things are going to change again. Um, and so it'll be, inter it'll be interesting to see. I, I just, I don't actually think I've had an empty house stroke office for a very long time. A very, probably a good, probably 18 months since it started. Um, and, but I'm, I've adjusted to it, but I can't say I'm not very excited at the, <laughs> the thought of, of getting a, an, an empty house back just for a, a little short period of time, just so I can, you know, really focus. I've, I've just not been able to, to do that. But I, th I, think, I think I will, I'm, de I'm def definitely different as a writer in, in my day-to-day -day writing process for sure do you not find that it's have you changed how I, you I'm, how just, you, did you... I'm just going to try and absorb some sandy I'm just going to be more sandy from now on um because if I could write my first drafts in three months I'd be delighted um lots more questions from from readers I'm also I'm, I'm hearing all your comments in the chat that you you really do want to discuss this ending and so what I'm going to suggest is that before we finish this session Sandy and I will give a spoiler warning and anyone who doesn't want to hear about the ending can uh, just turn their sound off for a bit and then we'll give you a big wave when you can turn it on again, okay? And that okay. way you'll, you'll hopefully all be happy um, that we won't spoil anything uh, if you don't want to. Um, have you been to Portugal, Nina would like to know? I have been to Portugal. Um, I spend a lot of time there as, as much as I possibly can. Um, and, and I just love being there. I've, we've been um, going there for probably 20 or so years. Um, so the children have spent, you know, lots of, of school holidays there. Um, it's, it's kind of our go-to place as soon as the schools break up. Um, obviously, restrictions allowing. 
Um, so yes, I, I do go there a lot and I absolutely adore it. it it's my, it's my favourite place to be in the whole wide world, for sure. And I think that really shows because the, the depictions, I mean, I really felt like I was eating in that little taverna, <laughs> the, um, you know, all the locals felt so real. It really was an, in, an incredible atmosphere. Um, Vicky would like to know, do you have a, a specific schedule for writing? Do, do you find that there's a better time of the day to write? I'm not a morning person. Um, obviously, deadlines um, mean that I do sometimes have to be a morning person, but um, I, I'm not great um, kind of certainly before 10. Um, my brain just doesn't doesn't work properly. Um, the wheels just don't turn correctly. So mm -hmm. I am much better. Um, and I, I could easily do a, a 10, 12 hour stretch, no problem, but it would be kind of 10 to 10 um, if I'm able to, um, or even going any later than that. I would I'd rather, much rather work in the evenings um, than, than the mornings. It's, it's, yeah, the mornings and, are evil for me. <laughs> and how many words do you like to get written in a, a good writing day? 2,000, I think, is probably a really good writing day. Um, I would be bitterly disappointed if it's not a thousand. Um, so that's my absolute bare minimum. Um, but but 2000 would be a, a comfortable day for me. But I don't, I don't often, do you, do you kind of clock up the, by words or do you kind of do by time or I don't? I, uh, I do word count over a week. So I, like, I like to roughly do 10,000 words a week. Um, okay. And that gives and do you work away. weekends as well, Claire, or do you do you have a Monday to Friday? Is this a Monday to Friday I, thing? For you? I'm Monday. I'm Monday to Friday. Are um, you? Do you tell tell us about your your office? Where describe? Are you, are you in your office now? You're writing. I now. am in my office. I'm very Can lucky. You paint yes. a picture with words. Describe oh. your writing space. What can you see? It is a very lovely, uh, obviously it's pitch black at the moment here in the UK, in London. Um, that happened very quickly. Um, so it is a very cosy um, environment. I have a lovely desk here, um, bought by my husband for a large birthday recently, um, and which is absolutely beautiful. It's very kind of art deco-esque, I would say, the room generally. Um, lots of kind of dark furniture and lots and lots of books. Uh, I have a whiteboard, <laughs> but it has nothing on it because I'm a pantser. So I, I've bought this lovely, lovely whiteboard and I've got very excited because I'm a stationary geek. I've got very excited with find all my markers and my different colour pieces of string and I'm going to link <laughs> everything together. And there's nothing on there, Claire, at all. Um, that's looking very sad and sorry for itself, but... Next book, I'm determined, determined to be more of a planner. I'm going to do this. <laughs> How do you keep track of, of your characters? So we know that you don't plan out your, your plot, but how much thought goes into who your characters are um, and whether they're... So, so we've got a lovely question um, from Shireen about um, whether you intentionally wanted them to be so brilliantly unlikable. Um, <laughs> so how, tell us a bit about the, the process of building those characters. Yeah, I, I, as I said earlier, I just want them to be ordinary people that I hope that we can all relate to or that we can all see somebody, some, either something of ourselves in them or certainly somebody we know. Um, I... Uh, yeah, I, I, about the unlikable thing, I, I have read a, a couple of reviews that have said, oh my God, they're so unlikable, I, I, can't, I can't possibly deal with them. Um, but I think that's the whole part of, I don't think you have to like your characters, or, or I don't think a reader has to like all the characters in a book, because I think that's unrealistic. We don't all like everybody. Um, and, you know, I, I, think, I think you can not, you know, you don't have to like everybody in the book you and they are I wouldn't say they're hugely unlike well I don't know but are they um I've lived with them for so long I wouldn't say they're for the most part they're hugely unlikable but obviously they they do reveal themselves um to be so by the end but I think for the most part they're they're okay kind of normal people I think I hope I think they are I think they're absolutely they're they're flawed 
humans yes, um, yes. so ali um really that the, all the intrigue uh, from the outset centers around ali who is our, our bride to be she's presented as very manipulative um she's caught out in in a couple of lies but there's a lot more to ali isn't there than the person that we meet in that through through rachel's eyes at, at, at the beginning um, did you enjoy unfolding her as a character and and kind of unseating the reader a bit? Yeah, I loved I loved Ali. Um, I I think I think most of us have uh, have an Ali like character in our lives. Um, if not now, then then certainly in the past. You know, perhaps perhaps we've given her a wide berth um, before. You know, thinking that she's too high maintenance, perhaps. Um, before maybe she's even had the chance to kind of show her true colours. I just, you know, maybe she was a larger than life personality like Ali is, um, who is kind of, you know, and we, we have all, we've all had seen and met one who has kind of been there and done it and, and kind of worn the t-shirt as it were. Um, but but I, I do also think that sometimes that, that bravado and that tendency to um, over-exaggerate is, is, is sometimes hiding a kind of a deep rooted insecurity. And, and it's, a, it's a mask that some people wear. And I just wanted Ali to be that person. And, you know, we're probably all guilty of, of judging a book by its cover for sure. Um, and, and she really is, she turned out to be in the end, the perfect example of that, I think. I, I loved, I loved mm. her. Mm. Was she your favorite character? Yes, yes, in this book she was, yeah. I, I just think her whole character arc from where she started or what, what, where she was perceived and who she was perceived to be at the very beginning um, and hopefully where readers saw her at the end. Um, mm. I, I just, I just, yeah, I just, I just enjoyed writing, writing that. And I just, I felt quite emotional about her actually at the end because I just thought, you know, she, she was hiding things that didn't, need to be hidden really you know her her big secrets were were not something that that needed to be kept secret but yeah mm. I, I won't say too much more and and of course her character arc doesn't just start where we meet her at the beginning of the book because you very cleverly give us her character journey right back from when she was much much younger, and and you know her her life there, and her um, her feelings about herself growing up. So we really have her her whole lifetime, um, which which I felt was really added something to, to the book. We weren't just seeing her on uh, uh, during this weekend. Right. The, the character okay. who frustrated me a little bit was mm. Rachel, who occasionally I just wanted to shake and say, could you not just have a conversation with your husband, with your friends, like, come on now. Um, did, did she maybe irritate you a little bit? Did, did you want her to front up to things? Yeah, um, yeah, she did. I was exactly the same, Claire, I have to be honest. Um, but I think, you know, I, again, it's, it's kind of that likability thing, isn't it? And and we do probably all have a Rachel in our lives. And I I think, you know, a lack of, of communication is, is, is generally, is, is responsible for a lot of negativity in our lives, um, even on a, a daily basis. You know, I just, we assume a great deal um, and we expect even more from others. And, and they in turn have, I guess, the same expectations of us. But without communicating those thoughts, we're we're kind of all on a hide into nothing, really. You know, it's you know, Rachel is. A, I think she's a lot. You know, she's like a lot of us. I think, you know, we overanalyze, we jump to conclusions um, before we've really thought things through. Um, but ultimately, she loved Jack, and and she didn't she didn't want to believe her suspicions, and she certainly, I don't think. She, did, she didn't want to rock the boat with him by airing them. So I think she just tried to convince herself that it, it that she'd got it wrong. Um, and, and she just didn't say anything, but by her not speaking out, you know, obviously it, it led to a, a kind of a, a catalog of errors um, that, that, that proved fatal ultimately, didn't it? Yeah, 
Yeah, and we've all, I was going to say, we've already all been there. We've Obviously all... <laughs> not, not to the extent that someone dies at a wedding, um, but we have all been somewhere where, yeah, communication is poor. Perhaps we don't want to know the, the answers. Now, I'm going to come back to reader questions because I've still got lots, but okay. this is the moment where we're going to move into spoiler territory. This is how it's going to work, okay? When we go into spoiler territory, I am going to raise my book <laughs> we're going to talk about the ending when you see me raise my book again that's when we're back you, you're safe to, to come back so if you don't want to hear this little discussion for five minutes about the ending then you need to uh, mute now okay the ending then what I'd like you to do is I would like you to tell us about the ending whatever you want to do. And then we'll just take two questions from the chat about the ending so that we uh, we get a chance to discuss it. So go, Sandy, what does okay. the ending mean? So, so as I said, it, there is possibly no right or wrong answer. And I like the idea that people can come to their own conclusion. However, in my head, um, Paige was alone in the car. Um, she had nobody else with her. She had, obviously her and Jack had a huge argument that led to her storming off up the hill um, and, and coming down, down back towards the restaurant. Um, I'm not sure what her intention was. I think it was just a spur of the moment thing. Um, she was just angry with him and kind of wanted to get back at him somehow or frighten him. Um, and I just think the two ladies at the end, um, Ali and Rachel, I think, because of his sort of foul behaviour, really, when you look at the whole, now when, with hindsight, when you look through the whole book of how he behaved and what he did, and also, I think, the final scenes in the hospital where he kind of, you know, just threw, was happy and prepared to throw everybody under the bus. Um, I think the, the two ladies just, all they needed to do was just stay quiet. They didn't tell any lies. Um, it was just a very unfortunate circumstance that the watch found itself in Paige's bag. But I don't think it means that Jack was there. And I just think the ladies decided to, to stay quiet and let him take the punishment that they felt he was due. What do you think? <laughs> I Wait, don't know. What do you I, think? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's completely how I read it. Okay, okay, um, that's good. Ra Rachel is about to... <laughs> To say to, to confess that she that she took the watch, yes. um, and then Ali is the one who says, who sort of silently says to her, "Let's just leave it. Let's keep stum. You know what's done is done." Yes. Um, so that yes. was certainly my interpretation of it. Right. Um, okay. If anybody has got any questions, put them in the chat. You've only got a couple of minutes before I raise my book again and we're back into um, <laughs> safer territory. Shireen thought that Rachel and Ali framed Jack for killing Paige and that Ali's mum fudged in court to further the framing. Shireen, I hope you're writing a book because uh, <laughs> I think you should be. Uh, ah, criminal defence attorney. Right, I'm going to go back now into uh, back where we were. So if you were on mute... Um, then you're safe now, you can come back. Right, gosh, that was very exciting. I've never done that in an, in an event before. Um, Susan would like to know, what made you become a writer? And, and earlier on in, in the chat, and apologies, I didn't catch your, your name. There was another question about whether you'd had any formal training. So perhaps we could combine those together. Oh, okay. Um, yes, huge imposter syndrome over here. No training whatsoever. Um, I didn't go to university. Um, and, you know, I, I, I vaguely remember when I was at 19, 20, perhaps going on a, a kind of a, a fictional writing or creative writing one day course uh, in London, um, which I saved up to go to. So I, so I obviously knew back then Claire, that I, that's what I wanted to do, but I kind of got lost for a good few years just trying to work out how on earth to get there. Um, so I, um, I went to, as a secretary, I went to a big media company in town and I pretty much prostituted my services, my, my kind of writing services, uh, to any editor in the building that would, that would take them. I was kind of down in a, in an advertising department and 
um, which was really cruel because I was so close to being able to write or being close to an editorial department, but I was stuck in uh, a grotty old advertising department that, that got no, you know, there was just no words to be had to play with. There was, it was just, it was just numbers and, and boring, uh, boring stuff. So, um, and, and a couple, one or two editors within the building kind of come back to me. Um, I don't even think we had emails and I think it was just some kind of message service on the bottom of my computer um, and just, oh yeah, okay, come up. Um, and yeah, and, and it kind of started from there. So I, I did it for free for probably a year or two, um, working alongside my secretarial job. Um, and, they, and they sent me out on some fabulous um, assignments. Sort of, I very quickly got into this kind of celebrity circuit. Um, and that's kind of where I specialised. Um, and you it's just kind for, of... You, you wrote for Hello magazine, didn't you? Yes, yes. So, yeah, but I've always, pretty much, I've always been freelance. Um, so I've always worked for a whole kind of host of publications and magazines. But in the main, um, I have I have remained freelance. And, and it's turned out OK. It has turned out OK. But then just sort of four years ago, um, hugely inspired by yourself, um, I just decided to to give it a, to give fiction writing a, a go, and yeah, and I don't, I, I do miss I do miss the um, the actual interviews and the chats themselves with kind of really interesting, inspiring people. But I don't miss I don't miss the celebrity mm. kind of thing at all. I really don't. So I'm I'm very happy. And also, it was just so restrictive. Now I look back on it what I was able to write, I was so restricted in, in what I was able to write. And I thought that that's why I was okay as a writer. I thought, okay, well, I've, I've, I've not got any room to move here, but obviously I'm able to interview people and I can deliver a decent kind of interview piece um, or profile piece. Um, so to fiction writing for me, I was thinking that there's no way I'm gonna have the imagination or it, it's just not gonna work. So, but now that I've kind of tried it and I think that I might have a, an imagination to kind of pull this off, I quite like it. I don't think I could go back anymore. <laughs> I, uh, I don't see how you can possibly have imposter syndrome when you have Reese Witherspoon's name on your books. That must've been the most phenomenal development to to happen in in this second career of yours how does that feel still still um you know we're a couple of years on from that and I, st I still can't you know none of this feels real clear to be honest you know none of it feels it just all feels like I'm living in some kind of parallel universe I think um certainly with with, with writing the other woman my debut um I did it secretly without telling anybody and and I really really honestly hand on heart did not expect anybody to read it at all so to, to go from from feeling that in my head to to having even Reese read it or you know it's just it's, it's just it's, in, it's insanity to me um yeah I I'm still blown away by just by anybody <laughs> reading my books I just think is a it's a crazy thing. It's, it's fun. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I just, I'm, I love it. What advice do you have for anyone who might be watching that would really love to write a book and doesn't know where to start? Oh, and it, it's just going to sound really kind of lame, but I ju just start, just start. I, I'm, I, I'm very good. I've been a very good procrastinator for a very long time. And um, I just think you you have to just put pen to paper or put your fingers on that keyboard because, you know, as my husband says, you know, if you don't, how, how are you going to know? How are you ever going to know if you don't try? You know, I was, I was forever kind of looking at the bestseller charts and just thinking, oh, I wish that was me. And oh, but but I hadn't written anything. So how on earth could I possibly have <laughs> even, even begun to think that I could? So I just, you know, I just, as, as easy as it sounds, or as hard as it sounds, it, it really is hard to start because there's always something that, that's going to stop you. You know, there's always going to be an excuse not to do it and it's not going to be the right time in your life. Or, but for whatever time, spare time you have, just just put pen to paper and just see where, where you go with it. And you'll you'll know. You'll know you'll know whether if it's something that you're engaged with and that you're interested in, then I think you'll you'll find a reader who is as well. 
absolutely and and i think it's really important to to break down a book and to remember that a book is is lots of small chunks of text that actually if you write something that's the length of an email and you do that every day then at the end of a year yeah. you're going to have a manuscript aren't you and you yeah. might need to do some some work on it but actually it's it's done um, yeah. but yeah just just starting is the key yeah absolutely. so um if you i'm just trying to work out the timings uh, you must have written another book already i guess I have, yes. The it, guilt trip. So yes. tell us where you're at now, what projects you've got on the go. Um, so my fifth book is um, work entitled. It's probably going to be the title, but work entitled at the moment is called The Blame Game. Um, nice, I like that. Did your son come up with that one? No, <laughs> no, this is one of mine. Hurrah! At last, I get a title that works. Um, yeah, it's, it's currently called The Blame Game, um, and it's a domestic suspense novel, again. Um, I think it's a lot more um, crimey, I think, than my previous novels. Um, it's still, as I say, it's still very much a domestic setting, but there's there's a, a certainly an element of, of who done it from, from the get-go. Um, which I've not really done before. And um, I, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed just uh, following our protagonist, um, Naomi, as she kind of unravels uh, the clues um, because she's, she's you know, the, she's got the name or the fingers pointing at her and, and she has to work out, you know, who is really responsible. And I'm really, I'm really enjoying it. So it's, it's almost done. Um, the, the dreaded edits came back a couple of days ago, so I'm just kind of ploughing through those at the moment. But it's 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 in good shape. It's in good shape. So it'll be sort of summer next year. Great. So people will be able to add that to their Barnes and Noble wish list, sort of early next year, I guess, and and get their pre-orders in. What about um, you, Claire? What what are you working on at the moment? I've I've always got a million projects. You have, on, I know. On the go, um, but I'm telling you now that on my to do list is to beg an early copy of the Blame Game, um, <laughs> which I already want to read. Have any of your books been optioned for screen? Uh, the other woman um, was quite early on, um, but it's going on and on and on. Um, so I think that kind of early excitement that. We, we feel when we when we're that lucky and we get that email going oh my goodness me um, that's yeah it's all going to happen tomorrow unfortunately is not the case is it when when it's optioned um so i'm not sure i think possibly there's 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 every chance unfortunately that kind of covid has, has made its impact on that industry as well a little um so i think it's a long way off um if at all if i'm really honest but I th no doubt if that is the case then then we'll certainly go again um you know once we're kind of out the other side of this I think it's, it's just been just it's just the unknown for everybody isn't it and just not knowing how much time yeah, and money absolutely. to invest in things um, and the the guilt trip I can really see as a maybe a six-part drama I've been watching Ooh. um nine perfect strangers <gasps> at the moment uh, Leanne Moriarty's and this feels very much like nine perfect strangers in terms of the sort of the the way it's been adapted um it is that how you'd like it on screen or do you see it as a movie no i th i think uh i think a, a, a sort of a, a six part or eight part of sort of drama on a sunday night would be just perfect <laughs> that would be the absolute yeah that would be the ultimate um yeah i mean yes it would be absolutely lovely but i don't I definitely don't write with, with that in mind. I, I you know, I, I definitely write for, for a novel, for, for paper. And if some wizard can kind of come along and turn those words into a, a screenplay, then, then fabulous. But that's a whole different discipline altogether, isn't it? I mean, that's... Yeah, have you, have I, you ever done any screenwriting? No, but I'd love to give it a go. I'd love to give it a go. I don't know. I mean, it is very different, though. I, I, I know it's very different. So, well, do you know what, Sandy, a very wise author called Sandy once told me that if you don't try, then you'll <laughs> never know. So really, <laughs> what you've got to do is just start. <laughs> that is very true. OK, thank you. 
Um, I, I was certainly, I would absolutely love to see the guilt trip on, on TV and it feels, yeah, it feels like something that, that could be really exciting. Do you ever, do you have a fantasy cast? I did have, this, that is actually on my whiteboard. I do have a fantasy cast. Oh, but it's so ridiculous, Claire. Oh, now, no, now, tell us. Oh, come on. You've got to tell us. I'm looking at it. Hold on, just bear with me one second, because I'll get you the pictures and you'll Brilliant. laugh. Go, go on, off, oh. off you go, off you go. Sandy will go and get us the pictures. Love making people, making people do things like this. Go and get the pictures, come back and tell us who is going to play. This shows you, this kind of shows you where my, my mind was at. You know, this is, this is really, we're talking proper fantasy now, Claire. So, we have this is my Jack, who I believe is Richard Maiden. He's Adam. lovely. And this is, funnily enough, is my Rachel, who's Rachel Weiss. Weiss. Oh, yes. She's very good. She's, yes. She was who I kind of pictured. <laughs> oh, the lovely Bradley Cooper is, is my Jack. Uh, no, sorry, is my Noah. Oh, no. Oh, okay. He's my Noah. Jodie, is it Coma? Coma? Yeah. You know, the Killing Eve actress. She's Paige. Yeah. yeah. I thought she'd be a great Paige. Definitely. Oh, what was he in? Oh, I he don't had know. his shirt my, off. In my kitchen, I'd like him, I think. <laughs> Paul Dark, Nia's saying. Oh, that's the one. He is my Will. <laughs> and this is lovely Ali. Now, mm, Readers oh. might be able to help me out. Is that Kate Upton? I don't know. I'm terrible at names. Absolutely terrible. Um, She's very Hollywood, she is. Debbie, um, Debbie says yes. Is that Kate? Right. That's well, my alley. Is, That's how I'm This is I'm absolutely marvellous. I love that you've done that. This is the best, the best looking uh, wedding party. Isn't it? Ever. I mean, the wedding photographer has just got it made, hasn't he? That's going to be in his or her portfolio for years. Um, we have just got a, a minute or two before we end. So I'm, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Um, please, 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 everybody, if you've already read The Guilt Trip, UK or US cover, please leave a review. It's so important for Sandy. It's so important for all authors. Go and tell people how much you loved it. If you haven't bought your copy yet, then what on earth are you waiting for? Head down to your local Barnes and Noble or click 24 seven on barnesandnoble.com and pick up your copy. I've been Claire McIntosh. This has been Sandy Jones. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you so much, Claire. That was amazing. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Good night. Bye.